All right, good evening. This is attorney Vincent Davis, and I have I'm on with a guest this evening, a live guest, Amy. And how do you pronounce your last name, Amy? Amy, can you hear Sorry, me? Sorry, uh, Euclid. Sorry about that. <laughs> how do you pronounce your last name? Euclid. All right, and Amy, where are you from? I'm originally I'm from Oklahoma, but I've lived in Oregon for since 2006. Oh really? Um, yeah. A few, a few months ago, yes, I had a I had a case up in uh, Bend, Oregon. Where in I forgot what county that is. What where are you in Oregon? Um, in Douglas County. Um, Bend, Oregon's about an hour. Um, I think uh, east. Yeah, east of here. Okay, oh, no, sorry, west. west. Sorry, west. Very beautiful country up there. It is. Very, it really is. Very pristine. Reminds me of. Um, yeah. I used to go to uh, Wyoming quite a bit, uh, a place yeah. called Du Bois, Wyoming, where the uh, Jerry Spence Trial Lawyers College is, and it's beautiful country, you know, there, and you see the mountains, yeah. the Teton Mountains and everything. So what's going on with CPS and Amy in Oregon? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, um, the... Um lawyer for the birth mother um uh, she pulled me as a witness and she got me up on the stand and i told my story and they asked me if i had said um is did i state that um cps is corrupt and i said yes i did and um they were uh, at the well by the end of it i mean that judge i mean we got a new judge at the last minute and the um, CPS workers were laughing in court, you know, just giggling it up before court. And by the time we were done, the judge was questioning CPS as to why were we good enough to be safety service providers for this child for her entire life. And why were we um, good enough to go through the foster application process? And we were the ones that raised her. Why were we good enough to do that? And they're question she's questioning about what them about why is a seven year old even talking about suicide? Well, hold on a second, Amy, because I'm Grace, my producer, um, may know about your story, but I'm sure, I mean, I don't, and may, perhaps our viewers don't know either. How are you related or involved in a CPS case if you're not the birth parents? Um, I met the birth mother um, when she moved here where I'm at now, and um, uh, I just kind of befriended her and was taking care of her for two years. And um, she got pregnant, and I just she, they took the baby from her at the hospital and gave the father full custody, and so so the mom could have visitation visitation with them um, with her through me. Um, they uh, proved me to be a safety service provider for her, and I just kind of ended up falling in love with her and raising her. You raising the mom or the child? The child, well, kind of both. Okay. <laughs> How old is the mom right now? Um, she's 40, I believe, 41. Holly, please be quiet. Sorry. I'm having to use my phone. Oh, you know, I'm, Sorry about that. And I'm getting some, some kind of noise or feedback from you as well. Uh-oh. It's my bird. I'm sorry. Polly, be quiet. You've been good all day. <laughs> sorry. I can meet myself while you're talking. All right. Um, hold on a second. So I got this question from the audience on YouTube. It says, hi, Mr. Davis, what's the number to call in if calling in is possible? So um, unfortunately, calling in is not possible at this time. You can post your email address and my producer, Grace, will contact you and perhaps even send you an invite uh, to come on the show this evening if you want. So you can just post your email, your name and, and your email address. And Grace, the producer, will be watching the comments on all the different social media platforms that we're um, streaming to tonight. And it, Grace will contact you. I think we're st we're streaming to about eight different social media platforms on Facebook and YouTube tonight, and I think one um, website 
on the internet. Uh, I think it's uh, beatcps.tv, uh, one of my channels where we have 24-7, 365 days a year, um, all kinds of topic and content about uh, battling CPS. Now, um, going back to you, Amy, we, okay, we you took your name off completely, huh? No? Hey. No, it says, Amy, you put her on there. Okay, it's not appearing on mine. So oh, I'm sorry. Oh, hi, okay. Cassandra. Was that a was that a bird that just flew in your head? <laughs> yes, the one that uh, Georgette uh, doesn't like. <laughs> so, oh, you're, hi. You're, are you the caretaker of the mother's child right now, the biological mother? No. Were you at one time? Yes. And did you do any type of battle to try to keep the child in your care and custody? Um, well, I did everything I could to keep her with me and get her back with me. Um, I went, we went through the foster application process and we got certified and they were going to open up our home. And three days later, I got a call from, uh, the um, my certifier telling me telling me that um sorry telling me that my um home is being closed and that um they're gonna have to put an extension on my certification so it's not just sitting in there out there open and um that was, I asked, when I asked why it was because the caseworker was not willing to give her back to us at this time she they said and from then on out it was just basically them deflecting and saying that. They were going to have meetings with the kids, the girls, to make sure they were okay with being split up. Obviously, in the future, <laughs> if we're going to be doing a show, it would probably be best to, to be in a different room than the bird. Yeah, because... I'm about to um, lock him up in another room. <laughs> okay. So he'll be quiet. My husband's trying to get him under control. He was being good until I started talking. You know, I've experienced a lot of things doing these live streams. Never a bird flying around. Landing on my head, no less. Right, right. Sorry about that. No, it's all right. So your experience with CPS obviously hasn't been good. Um, is there any way that you might get this child back in your custody? Possibly. Um, because we are moving into a, a bigger place, brand new place. It's just been done being built right now. We're moving next week, as a matter of fact. And so um, the mother's moving in with us. And so we're going to hopefully be able to get her back. Um, the judge just said she was not going to be able to make a decision on that case that day. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to get the, get a change to adoption. And well, so you know she what? said, I'm not doing that. Well, Amy, you, it's your lucky day because I'm going to give you some information that you may be able to use in your case up there in Oregon. Are, are you, um, do, okay. you have an do you have an attorney up there? No. Okay. So one yeah. of the things, I mean, is that your husband in back? What's he doing? Yes. He's trying to keep the bird quiet. <laughs> oh. So. Sorry. You don't have to get a pen and a piece of paper because you can watch this video over yeah. again. Right now, I just want you to listen to it. Same for people in the audience. Um, if you're ever in the situation, uh, you might be. You should talk to an attorney in your jurisdiction about this. So, Amy, I'm only licensed in California, but sometimes I represent people in different states, and when I do that, I have to get um, permission from the state. Uh, to represent you in court because I'm not licensed there. So I'm not licensed in Oregon. But if you were in California, okay, let's imagine that you're in California. I'm going to tell you what you can do to get the child back and what you can do uh, in your state. You're going to have to check that with an attorney in your state. So here we go. Number one, you know what? This case sounds very strange and you know you've alleged cps corruption mm -hmm. whenever you allege cps uh, corruption the first thing you should consider 
is making an official complaint with the United States federal government, okay, specifically the Department of Health and Human Services, all right? The Department of okay. Health and Human Services writes all the regulations that governs all CPS courts and laws and money throughout the United States, okay? Everything has to uh, comply with those federal regulations. If they don't comply with those federal regulations, what can happen is the state could lose its funding. And I can tell you from experience, at least here in California, um, California is not going to risk or no county in California is going to risk, you know, like L.A., billions of dollars because they're not complying with <laughs> Uh, the law, you know, some some rogue CPS worker might be out there doing something because of a personal agenda, but that's not going to be allowed to happen uh, when these you know millions and billions of dollars become at, you know at stake. So yeah. I'm aware of a case um, where uh, someone filed a complaint with the Department of Health and Human Services. And let me tell you about the case because I want you, I want you and the audience to understand the power the department has. Okay. Um, and when I say department, I mean the Federal Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. Um, these are the facts of the case. Mother lived with maternal grandmother and mother had a baby. And Mother had some, um, I guess, deficits. Uh, she, you know, in terms of uh, being able to take care of herself and take care of the baby, according to CPS. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they took the baby away from the mother and placed the mother, placed the child with a foster home. Now, the mother and grandmother fought by themselves or with their court appointed attorney to get the child placed back in their home and nothing they could do would um, allow them to get the child back. Now I might, I might tell you that there was nothing wrong with the grandmother. Um, the social workers in that particular County said that, you know, all oh, there were problems with the grandmother and we don't want to place the child with, uh, the grandmother, and we don't know if the grandmother is going to protect the child against the mother. You know, you hear these types of arguments all over the country, and they're, in my opinion, bullshit arguments in 99% of yeah. the cases. Does it ever happen? Yes, but it's so rare, you know, but it's one of those stock arguments that social workers use to keep the child away from the relative. So, yeah. you know, the, the case was going on and the, and the social workers through court ended up terminating the mother's rights and the child was being adopted by strangers in a foster home. Well, a complaint was made. The family somehow was advised to make a complaint uh, to the Department of Health and Human Services and, and to uh, the Justice Department. OK. And Amy, I just want to tell you, I muted you because that sound of the bird is bothering me. So they made a complaint to two places, the Department of Health and Human Services and the United States Justice Department for civil rights violations. The two complaints were combined and investigated by the Department of Health and Human Services. And they actually hired um, some social workers uh, at a national level and hired um, some experts to review this case. And they reviewed the case. And they found a lot of wrongdoing by the county and by the social workers in that county um, with respect to this child. Now, remember, this child, the parental rights were terminated and the child wa either was adopted or was being adopted by foster parents. OK. After they did this, they issued a letter um, of their findings and they told um, this particular county and state, hey, you know what? Um, we found wrongdoing and. We're not going to tell you um, what to do. 
All right. And, you know, the kid, the rights have been terminated and the kid is placed for adoption. But let us tell you this. If you don't return that child to at least the grandmother and probably and to the mother, uh, we're cutting off your federal funding. Now, <laughs> in what I can only describe as a miracle, the county reversed everything, took the kid from the foster parents, gave the kid back to the grandmother and the mother living there in the home, and, you know, went about their business. Then the foster parents who were adopting, um, from what I'm told, I wasn't involved in this part of it, um, sued the county because they, you know, they lost the kid. And the county quietly paid them off, you know, settled that case. The reason why I'm telling you the story is, do you see what can happen when you make a complaint, a legitimate complaint uh, to the federal government about these CPS cases? You know, the federal, the federal system of justice was developed by our founding fathers to put checks and balances on the state system of justice. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you states abuse their citizens. And the federal government or the founding fathers said, you know what, when that happens, you can go to the feds and uh, they'll review everything and perhaps protect your rights. Well, that's what happened in this particular case, right? So um, all, all's well, I guess, that ends well to get the kid back. So number one, that's where I tell you to start. You and or the mother should talk to someone, uh, perhaps a lawyer in Oregon, about making a complaint to the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Just Justice, the Civil Rights Division. Now, I am aware, and I personally know this, that um, most districts uh, throughout the country and in, in your district, your um, Department of Justice have a, has a civil rights division, you know, where things are investigated when your civil rights are violated. For example, let's say you lost a job because the owner told you, I don't um, hire white women with red hair, right? Well, you would have a complaint against that person. And you could get a lawyer and sue that employer in court and or you could go to the Justice Department and open up an investigation. And, you know, if they chose to take the case, you, your case would be investigated and perhaps prosecuted by the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. Okay? So that's the first thing that you should consider doing. The second thing that I would consider doing is filing the same type of complaint, administrative complaint, with the head social services agency in your state. Now, I happen to know that in Oregon, um, the CPS system is administered by the state. All those people are state employees. In California, it's administered by the counties, all right? Sometimes, in, in, in a way, that's a big difference. In a way, it's just the same. It's just a different agency. So you should file a complaint in Oregon with the state agency. You know, and it might be a local county that's doing it or a local state office where you live. But if you file the complaint uh, in that state at the, you know, the top, it, an investigation will be done. I happen to know that that is true because I was involved in a case in, you know, in Oregon. So that's the second thing that you should consider doing. People then ask me, well, shouldn't we do that same thing at a local level? You know, file a complaint there at your local county level or your local city level. And the answer to that is no. That I don't advise that. But of course, you're going to be consulting a lawyer in your area, he or she may have a different advice, but just for me, generally, I don't try to deal with local people. Um, local people, in my experience, um, you know, 35 years as a lawyer, local people are um, interested in protecting local people. So I don't usually invite, advise that. Okay, now here's the third thing you should do. The third thing you should do is you should consider by talking to a lawyer in your area, filing some type of federal lawsuit. 
not in state court, but in federal court. So you or the mother uh, might have rights that can be protected by a federal law called 42 U.S.C. 1983. It is the civil rights law um, in this country. It protects every person that's in this country, living in this country, and dealing, especially with government agents or government actors. All right. It provides damages. It provides punitive damages. It provides attorney's fees um, in order to give the attorney incentive to take the case when you may not have enough money to hire the attorney. Okay. And, and whether, you know, you have the money or not, uh, attorney's fees are always available if you prevail at the time of trial. Okay. So that's the third thing that you should consider. Now, the fourth thing that you consider is probably more unique to your state in your area. And I'm going to tell you, as if the case were in California, you personally should be filing what's called a 388 petition. And I know they have the same type of thing in Oregon. I forget the code section. Um, but you should file what's called a 388, which is a petition to the court to change orders or make orders, new orders, specifically that the child should be placed with you. You're entitled to perhaps a hearing on that, a trial, and you have to present witnesses. And this is where you are going to need an attorney. You know, a lot of people in California, I talk to a lot of people and they tell me, oh, I got the 388. You know, it's a form. It's just a judicial counsel form. You can get it off online for free. And they they believe that they can figure and fill it out by themselves. It's pretty straightforward. But here's the problem. When you file that 388, you may not prepare it correctly. All right? And I'm going to give you some examples. Number one, your 388 has to be supported by competent and admissible evidence. A lot of people thinking about filling out the form, you know, they're going to put in competent and admissible evidence. And a lot of times when I see people's 388 petitions, it doesn't have competent or admissible evidence. And when they lose, they claim the judge is corrupt. And that's not the case at all. The case at all, the real truth of the matter is you didn't know what you were doing. Right? So you got to have that competent and admissible evidence. And I stress admissible. You know, I learn about evidence every day, something new. You know, I've been a lawyer 35 years. I'm not going to tell you you know about evidence because I know you don't. But if I were to tell you, hey, you really don't know about admissible evidence, you're going to get pissed off at me and, you know, and think, well, I, Davis just wants to charge me money and do it. No, Davis wants to see you win because you're generally going to have one shot at this. And if you screw it up, it's not like you can get a rerun or a repeat. The next thing you should do is you should probably have legal points and authorities to, to support what you're requesting in your particular case. Now, in California, and the same is true in Oregon, there is a plethora of case law that supports different issues. So there may be a case like that in Oregon that supports you getting the relief you want. But if you don't know what the case law is, or you haven't researched it, or you don't know it, and you don't cite it to the judge, you know, the judge is not there to help you. The judge is there to make decisions on uh, disputes of fact and law. And if you don't bring up the law, don't count that he's going or she's going to bring it up for you. Okay. So you got the evidentiary problem. Um, you got the legal points and authorities issue. So at the very least, you should uh, draw up your 388 petition and you should have it reviewed by a lawyer. At the very most, you should just let the lawyer do it for you. It's well worth it, all right? So, you know, in California, they have this 388. It's a four-page document. People say, oh, I filled that out and I filed it, and they think they're going to get what they want. In California, not only when, once you file the 388, the judge has one hearing to determine if you even have shown enough evidence to even have a final hearing. So in California, you could file a 388, and then they have the hearing, and then you, the judge just decides where 
whether he or she is going to set it for some type of evidentiary hearing. Just because you get the right to have that evidentiary hearing doesn't mean that you're going to win. Doesn't mean that you're going to get what you look, which, what you want in the in the end. So you probably would want a lawyer to be arguing at that first hearing that you're entitled to a 388 hearing. Now, that wasn't always the law in California. I remember he filed a 388. You're supposed to get a hearing. It's supposed to be granted or denied. And, you know, and if it was granted, you get that hearing. And at the hearing, you may win, you may lose. But now they have a preliminary hearing where they say, well, we don't even know if we should give you a hearing or not. And then you go in that one and you think you're on your way. And then you have the real hearing, the permanent hearing, what I call, and then you might lose. All right. So you're going to need a lawyer to guide you through that. And if, if the lawyer, if you, you know, a lot of people don't have the money to hire lawyers. And one of the things I do is I offer coaching or consulting to people to walk them through step by step. Um, I have a person that has a hearing um Monday, this Monday, and I'm going to be helping them tomorrow prepare for that hearing. Uh, unfortunately, you know, she has decided to represent herself, uh, despite my pleas with her to go along with it, the attorney. Um, so I'm, you know, trying to help her do that, but it's kind of a hard thing. She has no experience. She knows nothing about procedure. She knows nothing about evidence. She knows nothing about ever evidentiary objections. She really doesn't know about the law. So she's starting behind the eight ball. Now, once you go through the 388 process, the other thing that you want to do is you want to, you might want to appeal at any stage of the 388 process. Notices of appeal have to be filed. Designation of the clerk's transcript and the reporter's transcript has to be done. You're going to need to talk to a lawyer about that. The fifth thing that you should do is, if the case were in California, you should consider filing what's called a de facto motion. I was listening very carefully to what you were saying, and you alluded to the fact that you took care of this child at some level before and after this case had started. Well, in California and in most states, you might qualify as what's called a de facto parent, which means you have standing in the court to present evidence and ask for things. See, right now, Amy, you're just some person out there who CPS is screwing with, and you may or may not get what you want. Well, when you're a de facto parent, you actually get, get to go into court, you have an attorney, and you, you're treated like as a party to the case. You have some skin in the game, all right? The next thing you should consider is in California, they have something called a petition for presumed parentage. In California, and, you know, I remember I, I, I researched this for Oregon. I forgot what the law actually said. But in California, a, a, a child can have more than two parents, a child can have more than two legal parents. And one of them is called a presumed parent. And a presumed parent, even though not a biological parent, can have the same rights as a biological parent. Sometimes a presumed parent can have more rights than the biological parent. So if you got declared a presumed parent, which I'm sure CPS would fight, you would um, be entitled to for example, reunification services, family maintenance services, perhaps uh, with rent to get that bigger place for the child, you know, all that type of stuff. A lot of times when a worker doesn't want you to have the child, they come up with all kinds of reasons, thinking that you won't be able to solve every particular thing they bring up. For example, oh, Amy, you need a bigger house. Well, they're probably going to assume you can't afford a bigger house, so, you know, she's going to lose. That may not be the case. And if you talk to a lawyer in your area, you might find out that your house is big enough. Or if you're a presumed parent or relative, you may not be subject to those requirements as if you were a stranger to the case. Okay? Uh, the next thing that I would do if you were in California is I'd file a petition to disclose the records. Um, you know, it's hard to win a case when you don't have any of the reports and minute orders and evidence that has been filed. Um, let me tell you what happened to me in a case in a county here in California. I represented some relatives 
um, who wanted the child placed with them. And, you know, I came across the argument, well, they're not parties to the case. They're not entitled to see the evidence and reports used against them. So I filed what's called an 827 to get a copy of the reports. And surprisingly, the judge denied my motion. But he said I could have a hearing on whether the children should be placed with my client. Now, at this hearing, and, and, you know, it just astounds me, but at this hearing, uh, they were using evidence that I couldn't see. And uh, it's hard to win these cases. It's harder to win these cases when you can't see the evidence. So they'd be talking about evidence, and I'd be there like, what are you guys talking about? I, you know, somehow I thought this was unconstitutional, right? Unfortunately, my clients didn't want to appeal this. At the end of this, when we lost and the foster parents got to keep the kid and the relatives didn't get the child, um, they didn't want to appeal. I thought that the appeal had a very strong chance of success. Like, how, how do you make me go to a trial? without showing me the evidence you're using against me. You know, how, how, how do you do that? doesn't even see, seem yeah. American. doesn't seem American. So yeah. that's the next thing that you should do is try to get the records disclosed to you so that you know what's going on. Because sometimes these reports that social workers have, they have all kind of crazy stuff. Like they may say, oh, you know what? Amy's a mass murderer. You know, they just say crazy comments like that. And then how are you mm -hmm. going to defend yourself? The judge is reading it on the one hand. Nobody's objecting to it. And then how do you how do you defend that if you don't even know about it? So, yeah, right. I didn't know. <laughs> Excuse me? so those, are, those are some of the things that you should do if you have, um, you know, a case where you're trying to get custody of a child. Uh, let me see. Hold on a second. I promised myself that I would keep up with the comments on the social media platform <laughs> people were watching. And I just happened to look up and there were like almost 30 comments and I hadn't even oh, seen. Um, oh, sorry. Anyway, Amy, did you have any other questions for me? Um, yeah, I did. Um, okay. The little girl raised the, um, in question here. Um, it was her oldest half sister who made this accusation against her dad. Why do they? Why did the police and no? Why did they not show up to the father's house and take laptops, phones, computers, and all this when it's a sexual assault um, accusation? And why is this not in? Um, um, why is this not in what? Uh, criminal court when this is a criminal act. I mean, it's clearly uh, that he's been accused been accused of. And he um, wound up almost dead from it. And they left the son with the, the sister's uh, son, uh, brother, sorry, excuse me, with the mother when they took the girls. Well, and you know, just talking to get away with that. Well, so, on me. so your CPS judge and your CPS social worker don't control and have nothing to do with whether a criminal case has started. That's up to the police and the district attorney in your jurisdiction. So when you say why, um, you know, I don't know. You know, generally crimes aren't prosecuted if the district attorney believes they don't have uh, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to win. You know, j um, DAs typically don't file cases that are shaky, right? They're supposed to look at yeah. the charge look at the evidence and decide whether they think they have a reasonable chance of winning. And if they do, they'll file a case. If they don't, generally they won't file the case. And I don't I see any that, reason why they would in this, in this case at all. Well, you know, here, here's the interesting thing, Amy. There are things that you know that they may not know. There are things that you assume that aren't true. There are things like evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And with all due respect to you, you may not know what that means. They may not, have evidence. They may not have evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. 
There are many reasons why a, um, a district attorney doesn't file cases. Some of them political. All right? Some of them political. Yes. So, so, you know, I, I, I don't want you to be concerned about that aspect of the case. You should just be thinking about getting the child back in your custody. And whether they okay. prosecute somebody or not for a crime won't affect you getting the child back at all. Right? Yeah. Okay. So if that's right, why, why are we even worried about it? Why are we even talking about it? Because there's something there, I'm sure, <laughs> that, they, that they're going to try to use. Well, you know, let's try to approach these cases efficiently, you know, do it, do it the smart way. And I tell people all of, I tell people all the, all the time, Hey, I know you have a feeling, but that feeling is not what's going to win or lose this case for you. If you have competent, relevant, admissible evidence, let's talk about that. If you don't, let's not talk about it. You know, on my YouTube channel, oh. on my YouTube channel, I have a video. I'm standing in front of a whiteboard, you know, drawing things on the board. And the name of the video is called What is Justice? And it's about a seven minute video. And I would suggest you and everybody else that's watching this find that that video on YouTube and watch it because justice isn't what you think it is. I can guarantee you. I don't know. Right. Yeah, and that's so, why I was having trouble with school. I mean, with social studies in school is because the three branches of government that you were uh, speaking of and how they're supposed to balance each other out, and they just they don't anymore. And it's, it's totally not how it works anymore. People can't well, do this what? stuff without a lawyer. A good lawyer. So. Right. You know, I I I don't think that there was ever a time that the judicial system favored the unrepresented. You know, the system of justice we have, you know, was um, developed by founding fathers, most who, who were attorneys. So a lot of times they think, or a lot of the rights that you have, you know, it's as if you had to have an attorney, Right? in order to get somewhere in the system. You know, it's a prime example of that. I, you may be too young to remember this, but do you remember a football player by the name of O.J. Simpson? Yes. He, was, he was accused of killing his, his ex-wife and um, uh, her, I guess, boyfriend or something. Boyfriend, yeah. Heinous crime, heinous crime, right? He, he went to trial for that, and he was found not guilty. Yeah. Not guilty. Now, most people, not all, but most people say, you know, they've reviewed the case or reviewed the evidence or they watched it on TV. It was like the trial of the century. Um, I mean, he, in my opinion, he won that case because he had a, an outstanding legal team. Outstanding. Yes, you know, he did. <laughs> you know, you know yes. in the courtroom, there was um, Johnny Cochran, one of the greatest, you know, defense lawyers of all time. Yeah. There was a guy named Sheck who was brilliant on scientific evidence. I think he had written books or some articles about, you know, how to beat or use scientific evidence. Um, there was another famous attorney, uh, constitutional attorney, that was on the team. And then there was uh, the Kardashian guy. And then there were two yeah. lawyers in the background who, who sat kind of like in the back that were... Um, very skilled attorneys and who are very famous attorneys now. Uh, one of them's one of them's name is um, uh, God. I can't think of their names. I'm sorry. One's a woman. Her first name is Sean. I can't think of her last name. Oh, Carl Douglas. Okay. Carl Douglas was you know carrying Johnny Cochran's briefcase at that time, and he's a great lawyer in and of himself. So O.J. Simpson had the dream team, and he won. Yes, he did. Okay. He's out, you know, walking the streets now. Oh, is so, he? So, yeah. 
Yeah, he he later got convicted for something kind of wacky in Nevada. Memorabilia. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, memorabilia, right? But he is um he served his time in that, and he's out, and he's on the streets. Oh, wow. I just I just saw something on uh, the news. He was commenting on, uh, I think it was in the NFL football team or something recently, right? <laughs> but, but, but the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, irrespective of what people say, you got to have a lawyer. You got to have a good lawyer. I'm sorry to say that. You know, people, a lot of people think, well, justice is justice and right is right. And God damn it, if I go to court and I'm right, I'm going to win. No, yeah. that's not going to happen. No. You should, you know, and everybody should watch, go to my YouTube channel and, and watch the video, you know, just search for it. What is justice? And I think there's actually two videos I made at different times about what is justice. The one I want you to watch is the one where I'm standing in front of a whiteboard with a marker, yeah. you know. And I'm drawing on the board. Yeah. It's a seven minute video. It will open your eyes and it'll make you think differently about every legal case that you're involved with, including, including these CPS cases. Okay. Yeah, so those, 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 those are the things that I think that you should focus on uh, and talk to a lawyer. You know, a lot of times you can go get uh, talk to a lawyer and get a free consultation where he yeah. or she might be able to help you or guide you in the right way. So Maybe out of town, perhaps. Consider <laughs> doing that. Consider city. doing that. All right, so I'm just going through these comments. Yeah, I was reading there, Brianna Collins. She never offered a case plan as court ordered. TPR, oh, that's terrible. All righty. Sounds like she's not, that doesn't, that sounds fishy and foul too, though. Right, right. So, Amy, do you have any other questions for me this evening? And while people are um, listening, if you, if you contact Grace, grace at vincentwdavis.com, uh, she can make arrangements to bring you on the live stream tonight. Although we've been, we've almost been on about 45 minutes. So, any questions you have for me, uh, Amy? Um, is there a certain type of lawyer to get? Yeah, so that's, for, that's, for that's, that's a good question. That's a good question. In California, they're known as juvenile dependency lawyers. Okay. Uh, I I basically tell people you want a CPS defense attorney. Okay. Okay. And it's kind of a unique, you know, expertise. Um, you know, I know a lot of lawyers that are family law and criminal lawyers here in Los Angeles County who won't touch a juvenile dependency case because it, it has so many yeah. special rules um, to it uh, that, you know, they just won't touch it. You know, generally in, in California, I don't know if it's like this in Oregon, but you can't even you're not even supposed to be able to um, practice in the juvenile dependency court unless you have a certain amount of expertise because and experience. Because what happens is, say, you know, I'm a lawyer and I don't know anything about juvenile dependency. I do entertainment law. Um, if you lose your rights in a um, CPS case, you could then appeal and say you had ineffective assistance of counsel. And that basically what that tells the court is that, you know, Davis didn't know what he was doing. Therefore, you should throw everything out and start it all over again. So I know for a while, and I think it still is the law, if the judge doesn't know you or know of you, um, they're supposed to be making an inquiry into your experience and expertise and education in this area. I know um, this happened a few years back. You know, I had been practicing over 30 years in this area of law. And a, a judge who didn't know me, um, you know, asked me uh, and went into detail into my qualifications to represent somebody in a CPS case. And it was actually in San Diego County. And um, I, you know, I qualified, but it was just, you know, something that I don't usually come across. Uh, yeah. But. So make sure that when you talk to an attorney, you find the right type of attorney and don't do what a lot of people do. Okay. Here's what a lot of people do too. 
you go to an attorney and he or she says, oh, I can handle the case. All right. Which may or may not be true, but they don't really have the experience. So you want to ask them, you know, well, how many dependency cases or juvenile dependency cases or CPS cases have you actually done in court? You know, and okay. sometimes you're going to be surprised. I had an attorney tell me recently that, you know, they were, they considered themselves experienced because they had done about 10 to 12 cases. And, you know, I guess there's a level, you know, it's all relative um, of competence, you know, in these cases. And I, in my mind, I didn't say anything, you know, I don't want to put them down, but in my mind, they really didn't have the experience to be on this type of case. The case was um, what we call a broken bone case where um, the kid had some fractures, a baby had fractures, and the social worker was um, recommending that the, the child never be returned to the parents, right? And uh, you, you want to make sure that if you have that type of case, that you have an attorney with experience in broken bone cases and what they call no reunification service cases so that they can represent you adequately. You know, that's much different yeah. than, oh, you know, mom and dad had a domestic violence incident because of alcohol. Uh, that's, that's a whole different scene. That's a whole different story. Same courtroom, same judges, you know, same laws. Different cases, though. Different cases. The judges won't take the case because it's already started. Uh, what, Jeff? The judges won't, or a lot of the lawyers won't take the case because it's already started. Oh, uh, yeah, we get a lot of um, um, lawyers telling us that they won't take the case because the case is already it's ongoing and it's already started. Yeah, but that, and so, in my opinion, an attorney that tells you that is not really experienced in CPS cases. Because CPS cases, are, CPS cases are divided into what I call five or six distinct models or modules, okay? And module one is much different from module four, all right? Yeah. And even though the case has started, it's not a continuous thing, right? It changes every so often in the, depending on where the case is. It, the focus of the case changes. The laws change. The evidentiary rules change. You know, the procedure changes. So for an attorney to tell you that either they didn't want to take the case to begin with um, for whatever reason, or they're not as experienced as you might have wanted to begin with. You know, somebody asked me, well, how many cases yeah. should an attorney have under his or her belt? And, I, you know, just speaking from my point of view, okay, this isn't going to be the same for everyone, but speaking from my, if they haven't done at least 100 cases, they're probably not experienced. 100 cases, oh my God, that's a lot of cases, right? But yeah, that's, just, it is. that's just my opinion. Yeah, so right. you really want to interview them really well and get their background and get some information. Yes, absolutely. So Amy, any um, other questions you have for me today? Um, no, uh, but I do have a statement. If I just, you know, if people watch your show, I mean, you watch enough of your videos, uh, you'll eventually figure it out. I mean, on how to win your case. Okay. Well, you, you know, I do all of those videos. I think we have maybe three or four hundred videos on YouTube now, and we, yeah. you know, yeah. I try to publish one every day, um, just to give people information, right? Yes. Um, you know, and a lot of times the information that they have uh, is not accurate, 100%. And uh, yeah. I give them different things to, to think about. Um, and, you know, I just want people to be aware of what their rights are and, you know, what they do yeah. with it. You know, that's up to them. But at least I can make you aware of what your rights are and what a general thing about what you might want to do or talk to your attorney, yeah. you know, about doing. Um, because these are very strange and foreign cases. I just had someone tell yeah. me, I, I, here, here's something very, it's not funny, but it, I kind of chuckled to myself. Um, they were going to, they were supposed to go to court on Monday for a trial. And they said, oh, well, you know, we'll come see you on Wednesday. 
um, we'll just go to court on Monday and tell the judge, uh, you know, we want a continuance. We're not ready. And I said, well, you know, that's, you know, that, that might work in criminal court, right? But that doesn't work in juvenile yeah. court. There are rules against it. And they went to court on Monday and thinking they were going to get a continuance. And the judge made them go forward with the trial. They didn't have any witnesses that they were there. Their attorney, you know, told them, oh, you got to bring the witnesses. And they thought, oh, we'll get this continuance and we can, you know, go talk to Davis a couple of days later and then he'll have a month to prepare. No. There are laws, you know, there are laws actually against that. So you, you oh, can't get you can't get continuances in these CPS cases as easily as you might if it was a criminal case. And and, it, and a lot of people I tell that to, they, they're like, mm, they don't really believe me because that's not their experience. You know, they have been, may have been involved in criminal cases where they got a continuance snapping their finger. It, but they're not used to, you know, the strict rules in a CPS yeah. case. So they don't, um, you know, they don't fare very well. And then they kind of, the first thing they do is um, they claim corruption, right? And they claim unfairness. The truth of the matter is that they didn't know the rules, right? You got to know the rules of the game. And the rules in CPS court are not the same rules as in criminal court or civil court. It's totally different. And a lot of people have, have no rights. Yeah. A lot of people have um a hard time wrapping their, their head around that. So anyway, if you or your husband uh don't have any other questions, I'm gonna call it tonight. Any other questions? Any other questions? No. No, no, they said no, thank, thank you. you. Okay. What? All right. Well, thank you for okay. Amy. For uh, no, thank you well, for having me on. It was awesome. It was amazing. I'm glad to be here. All right. And I'm you know, sorry to all the other people out there going through this. And yeah, you know, I I haven't done this in a long time, and I used to do it, you know, frequently. And I just got a message from one of the people in my office saying, you know, you should do this. So, um, you know, Grace, I don't know if you're listening, but I I think I'll do this tomorrow evening as well. Anyway, stand by, check your social media platforms and see if we put out a post. Maybe I'll just do this show again on um, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Okay? All right, I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, and if you guys have any questions or about getting in contact with me, my telephone number is right on the screen, 888 And you can always email you can email grace at vincentwdavis.com. I'm going to put this, I'm going to type this so that everybody can see. V-I-N-C-E-N-T-W-D-A-V-I-S.com. If you want to get in touch and be on the show like Amy was just tonight, or you have questions specifically, go ahead and email grace. All right, she's the producer of these shows for us. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching, and uh, see you tomorrow night, perhaps. Good night. Yes.